On October 25th in 2012, a mother found her children, well, what was left of her children, all of whose lives were taken by the babysitter. Only seconds before, the person she trusted to take care of them in her absence. Never forget how important it is to find a trustworthy babysitter. You're watching Darkness Prevails, the best channel to share your creepy stories with the world, because this world is a strange one. When you work and your significant other works, sometimes you just have to have a babysitter. You can't just leave your kids alone. Well, sometimes leaving them alone all day ends up being a better idea than leaving them with a creepy babysitter. The following allegedly true stories are about creepy babysitters or the horrific things that can happen while babysitting. Enjoy. Remember, if you want to be in a future video, send me your online gaming stories at darknessprevails.org slash submit. And go download my free app at darknessprevails.org slash app for all my videos, thousands of horror stories, and a place to submit your stories on the go all in one place. Now, let's go out for the evening and hope that the children are all intact when we get back. Number one. Nightmare of a Babysitter, submitted by Whiplash. This took place three years ago when I was 13. I also have a sister who at the time was only five. My parents were going out with some friends for the evening, so they called a babysitter to watch me and my sister until they got home. My parents left before the sitter arrived, so we had no idea when she would be coming. At the time, we lived in a pretty big house where all our neighbors were a good mile and a half away from us. When the sitter arrived, she seemed like a normal girl. She was in her mid-twenties and looked very nice. She was very overdressed for the occasion and she had applied a fair amount of makeup, which in a sense was unsettling. Why was she so prepared? She introduced herself as Sandra. The evening started out normal. She and my sister played board games and watched a movie since we didn't have school the next day. I mostly stayed in my bedroom on my laptop since I thought I was too old for a sitter. Around 6.30 that night, Sandra called me down for dinner. When I came downstairs, I saw my little sister's head down on the table. Oh, did she already fall asleep? I asked. Yeah, she only took a couple of bites and she went out cold, Sandra replied with an unsettlingly high and peppy voice. After I ate, I started up the stairs to my bedroom, but I stopped suddenly when I felt breathing down my neck. I turned to see no one behind me. I thought it was just the AC acting up and went up to my bedroom. About two hours passed before it started getting weird. I was casually surfing YouTube for the latest updates on all my favorite channels when I heard my bedroom door creak open. I turned to see Sandra standing there, but then I noticed she had removed her makeup and changed into something else. She was wearing a white t-shirt and tight pink undies. This was weird because she hadn't brought a bag with her. Where did the clothes come from? She walked over to me and looked over my shoulder at what I was doing on the computer. Then she started to massage my shoulders. I asked her to stop because it was weird and she did, but I could tell that this upset her somewhat. She walked over to my closet then stepped inside. I was wondering what the heck she was doing and went to check it out. As soon as I opened the closet door, everything went black. I don't know how much time passed before I woke up, but when I did wake up, my head felt horrible. I was dizzy and it felt like someone had hit me in the back of the head. After a few seconds, I realized in horror, Sandra was standing over me. She was no longer wearing the shirt and I could feel some fluid on the back of my head, something warm and moist. Then Sandra placed her hand around my throat and I began to scream for my little sister, asking her to call 911. Then I remembered she was probably still asleep, so it was up to me to defend myself. 
I worked up the nerve to kick Sandra off of me, and I ran downstairs and grabbed the house phone. As I began to dial, my heart stood still as I saw Sandra at the top of the steps coming towards me. Just as I had dialed 911, Sandra was at the bottom of the steps and had rounded the corner. She wasn't coming after me. I thought, okay, and dialed the number. And that's when the power in the entire place went out. She hadn't been coming for me because she had gone for the fuse box. Just to be sure what happened, I looked out the window to see that the street lights were still on. This definitely wasn't a power outage. I wasn't about to stay here. Even if it meant leaving my sister, I wouldn't be able to protect her without help. So I grabbed my bike and I rode for the closest neighbor's place. But as I mentioned, that was a mile and a half down the road. Only halfway there, I began to see headlights coming up behind me. So I naturally rode to the side so that they could pass. But they didn't. They got close to the point where I ditched my bike and ran into the woods that surrounded the road. As I jumped off my bike, I heard the crunching of the car crushing it. At that point, I knew my instincts were right. That was Sandra behind the wheel. I ran into the woods, and I remembered me and my neighbor's kids built a treehouse halfway between our houses. It'd be better than nothing. It didn't take long to find, even in the dark and I climbed the ladder and opened the trap door to get inside. Below, I heard Sandra crunching around in the fallen leaves. She was calling my name. At this point, I remembered the walkie-talkie we kept in the treehouse. I hastily searched the small space for it. When I found it, I called the older boy at the neighbors and told him the situation. And thankfully, he believed me, and he called 911. When Sandra heard the sirens a while later, she booked it back to her car. I could hear tires screeching down the road, and eventually, it all faded into nothingness. I climbed down and walked home. My sister was still in the kitchen where I'd last seen her. I thought nothing of it, and I fell asleep on the couch. I was exhausted, and I think I may have been in shock. It wasn't until the next day, I learned that Sandra had fed us something in the pizza she served the previous night to knock us out, but apparently she didn't put enough for me since I was older. To this day, I wonder what was wrong with her and what she was trying to do with me. We ended up moving a couple of months later, partly due to the fact that the police turned up nothing in their search for her. Thank God we never had a sitter again. Number two, the not-so-alive babysitter, submitted by Maddie. I'm 16 years old, and I live in Texas. Just about a week or so ago, my dad left me and my six-year-old sister at home. At the time, my stepmom was at work, while my dad and another little sister of mine were off doing other things. Let's just say my sister hit her terrible twos at the age of five, and she's still kind of a handful, so she constantly gives me angry looks and tells me Sue mad because I won't do this or that for her, you know, being a typical child. Well, that particular day, she was behaving well for me, so I decided to make her some ice cream, and since my sisters love sprinkles and my dad practically spoils us and gets us what we want, we had tons of different assorted sprinkles, so I had let my sister decorate her ice cream. While I went to put the ice cream up, my sister suddenly went quiet, stopped what she was doing, and looked into the living room. The lights had turned off. Then she suddenly started calling out for her dad, who wasn't there at the time. Confused, I glanced where she was looking, and I saw a dark figure. I had a gut feeling it wasn't my dad or my sister returning home, as I hadn't seen or heard from either of them. I quickly grabbed Sue by the hand and dragged her wherever I went. I grabbed a broom and I went into the living room cautiously. I told her to stay behind me and I opened the front door to see that the cars were still gone. I then went and glanced into each room to see if anyone else was home. I didn't find anyone, 
but I knew I saw someone before. I was frightened still. I pulled us into my bedroom, and I shut and locked the door behind us. I began to hear voices coming from outside, so to be cautious, I looked out the window in my room, but still, no cars. We were home alone. And then came the scraping at the door, as if someone was running all their fingernails down it slowly from the other side. We were not alone in that house anymore. I called my dad to explain the situation. He came home quickly and checked the house, but there was no one there. Unfortunately for me, my stepmom and my dad were both going out that night, so I'd be babysitting all the siblings. When they left, I locked all the doors and had all the dogs inside. This included our pit bulls and Yorkie. I didn't experience anything else for the rest of the night, nor have I experienced anything since then. But the same question runs through my mind over and over. How did we not find anyone? We never heard any doors or windows open and close. So, was it a ghost? Or was someone actually inside our house? We don't know. We still don't. But as long as it doesn't happen again, I don't care. But I will be keeping a closer eye on my little sisters. Number three, Babysitting. Submitted by Riley. I had just turned 16. I was babysitting for multiple people around town. I didn't live in the best neighborhood. I had babysat multiple times and was pretty good at dealing with weird kids though. I was also trained to deal with slower kids. I posted ads on social media under a different account so it wasn't on my personal one, and that's how I began to accept jobs from all over. This story happened about a year ago. It was a day in October, I'd gotten a request for a babysitting job a few miles from my house. I won't go into too many details about the email, but it seemed to be sent from a normal dad needing a babysitter. He said his name was John. We went back and forth about dates and pay, but we settled on a decent rate. On the day of the job, I had my older brother drop me off. The minute I got out of the car, I wanted to go home. It was an average looking house, but something was just off about it. One of the first things I noticed were the security cameras everywhere, and secondly, there were no toys or anything in the yard that depicted that a kid lived there. I assumed he cleaned them up frequently, so I continued to walk up to the door. Before I could even knock on the front door, it opened and a man stepped out. He was almost a foot taller than me, and he looked like all he ever did was lift weights. He was dirty, homeless looking. He smiled when he saw me and invited me in. He told me his son was at school, and this set off alarms in my head. It was a Saturday. Why was his son at school? And why was I here if the kid wasn't here? He started giving me a tour of the house. The place was fairly clean, but another alarm went off when I noticed the rolls of duct tape in every room. He took me upstairs to show me his son's playroom but when he opened the door, my heart sank. There were no children's toys. There hadn't been any trace of a child here at all. What was in the room, though, was a single mattress in the center. All I could do was whisper a no and began to walk out of the house, but then he grabbed me by my arm. He was much larger than me, so fighting back wasn't doing much. I began screaming, but he put his hand over my mouth and told me to shut up, or I'd be worrying the neighbors. I didn't listen. I screamed until my voice nearly gave out. He kept muttering curses under his breath. He dragged me down the stairs by my shirt, apparently changing his mind about the room for whatever reason. But at the same time, he had been pulling on my shirt, and my shirt ripped, giving me the opportunity I needed to get out of there. The cops had been called by the neighbors, luckily, so a few minutes later, they arrived at his house and arrested him because multiple neighbors had called, and they'd seen me running with my shirt torn away from the place. I'm glad he got what he deserved, but ever since then, I've grown to have a fear of babysitting, and I haven't had a babysitting job since. Number four, get out. 
submitted by A. Ray Ryzen. When I was around 10 years old, I went with my older sister to a babysitting job she had so I could meet the kids and make new friends. We played for a while and had fun. The oldest one and I did her little brother's makeup to make him look like a clown. At some point, we started talking about ghosts. They told me that there was a ghost in one of their closets, that if you stood or sat in the closet next to a specific jacket, it would grab you by your arm and pull you down. We talked some more about ghosts and similar things for a while. Then we decided to do something that I regret. We decided to see if the ghost would talk to us. We put out a blank piece of paper and a scarlet crayon on the table in the room the closet was in. I think it was a dining room. And we asked a few questions, like what its name was, how did they pass, stuff like that. Then we all went into the living room make sure we shut the door to that one room and no one left our little group. I don't remember how long we waited, but we eventually went back into the room to see if any answers to our questions had been written down on the paper. Well, there was something else on the paper, but it wasn't what we were expecting. Written on it, in all capital letters, was GET OUT. We were all horrified, we left the room and got out another piece of paper. One by one, we all wrote get out in capital letters to compare to the one from that room. The only one who didn't do it was the little brother. He was the youngest of us all, and he didn't even know how to write yet. After that night, I never went back there, but I hope whatever was in that house was gone. After seeing what was written on the paper, I wholeheartedly believe that if I was in that closet, something would have pulled me down. Number five, Sheev Talks, submitted by Cody. This happened over the summer of 2017. I had just passed my sophomore year of high school by a hair, and I was now free to get some work. I was 16 and I was feeling confident that I would be hired somewhere. I needed the money if I was going to start saving for college. Despite all the jobs I applied for at various local businesses, I was turned down by every single one of them, and I was beginning to become desperate. Summer was nearly halfway over, and if I didn't make money now, I wouldn't have time to work during the school year. I eventually was forced to cave, and I resorted to taking a job as a babysitter which I'd been warned by friends and relatives to never do. My mother had once been a babysitter herself, and she says to this day, it was the worst job she's ever had. Mom told her friend from work, who we'll call Charlene, that I was looking for work as a babysitter, because Charlene had always been complaining that she could never find a cheap enough sitter to watch her son, who we'll call Joey. Mom volunteered me for a very cheap pay but I realized that if I charged as much as the professionals, there would have been no point in hiring me, which was why I settled with three bucks an hour. The following evening would be my first night watching Joey. Charlene was having to work the late shift and she wouldn't be home until nearly 2.30 a.m. I was willing to stay up until then and even brought over a book to keep myself entertained. I was in the middle of reading it, Star Wars Aftermath, and I knew this would be a good opportunity to finally finish the thing. Charlene told me to have Joey in bed by 10.30 and to help myself to anything in the fridge. She said that Joey and I could basically do whatever we wanted to do, as long as we were inside by nine. I wasn't sure why, but she drastically stressed to me that Joey wasn't to be out after nine o'clock. After that, she left for the evening and Joey and I were left alone. We decided to play board games for a couple of hours, and then after heating up the leftover pizza in the refrigerator, we sat in front of the TV, then watched SpongeBob for the rest of the night. At 10 p.m., I told a reluctant Joey that it was time to start getting ready for bed, so he brushed his teeth, got in his pajamas, and went into his room. After he went to bed, I read a few chapters of my book, 
and turned on the TV to watch some Tonight shows. At around midnight, I went to check on Joey. I wanted to make sure he'd really gone to sleep because I was sure his mom would be mad if she came home in the middle of the night and her son was still awake. When I went to turn the doorknob, the bedroom door was locked. I wasn't sure if Joey was allowed to lock his door at night, but I didn't want to ask him and risk him waking up if he was asleep. And I didn't want to be that babysitter who nags the parents with questions while they're out, so I didn't want to bother Charlene while at work, even though she did say to call her if there was an issue. I decided to just leave it the way it was, and if Charlene asked why the door was locked, I would pretend I had no idea what she was talking about. I went back down to the living room to continue watching my shows, and about a half hour later, I heard the most piercing sound reach my ears. I swear my eardrums nearly burst. It came from Joey's room. More specifically, it came from Joey. He was screaming at the top of his lungs in the most high-pitched screech, and it caught me completely off guard. I nearly toppled over the couch. The screaming became louder and it wouldn't stop, so I ran for his room, trying with all my might to get in. The door was still locked, and what was worse, it was now scorching. It branded my hand, seething my palm the moment I touched it, and I yanked it back. I began pounding on the door, telling Joey to let me in, but I was sure he had no control over whatever the situation was inside. His scream intensified, and I began to grow more and more worried. What was happening in there? I began kicking at the door, and when it wouldn't budge, I went all the way down to the end of the hallway and bolted toward the door, gathering all of my strength. I slammed my shoulder into the door, and with a combination of force between my weight and my strength, I knocked the door away from its hinges at last. I fell to the floor, but was instantly back to my feet. What I saw that moment instantly sent chills down my spine. I mean, I barged in there expecting some sort of electrical fire, expecting to see Joey screaming because the place was ablaze. That would explain the burning doorknob, but what I saw that night has no explanation. There was a figure hovering over a crying Joey. The figure was solid black. I saw no face, but I could tell that it was looking at me by the way it turned its, I wouldn't necessarily call it a head, but its head churned in my direction. It wasn't a tangible looking thing, more like a person's shadow had pried itself from the ground and now stood like a human being. I could feel something emanating from it, like a darkness splitting my soul. Then it pointed at me, and as if by some jump cut in a movie, it was suddenly in front of me. Then it walked through me, and hurried down the dark hallway outside. And by God, let me tell you how that felt. When it went through me, it was like the first time in my life I felt completely empty. As if all my life had been drained from my body, and every hope and dream pulled away from me. I fell to my knees because my legs buckled. I could hear Joey crying, but he seemed to be taking comfort knowing I was there. We just stared at each other for a moment before I pulled out my phone and called the cops. Then I called Charlene. The cops showed up long before Charlene because she and my mother worked at a brewery far away from civilization. When Charlene arrived, I told her everything and she seemed to already know everything I was going to say. I demanded to know what she knew about that thing, but she instead rushed me out of the house and told me I was never welcome there again. To this day, months later, I still don't know what it was I saw that night, and I don't know what's going on at Joey's house. I hope he's okay, but I am glad that I never have to go back there. Number six, The Thing in the Forest, submitted by The Figure. It started when I got a babysitting job from one of my neighbors. That day they had to go to a meeting. I was about 18 when it happened and it was really easy taking care of their baby. And honestly, it was a fun time at first. 
That was until the baby began to cry. I had a very hard time calming it down. When I did, I began hearing banging on the walls outside. I opened the door to see what it could have been, but I saw no one and found nothing, so I closed the door. I put the baby back to sleep, and I rested on the couch watching some TV. An hour later, I heard the banging again, and I was quickly getting annoyed by this. I opened the door and walked around the house with a flashlight and a knife just in case. Again, I found nothing. I was thinking it was some prankster, and I was getting very tired of this. But then, I heard this loud and horrific screech. I covered my ears and went back to the house, and I realized the screeching was coming from inside. When I walked in through the door that I had left ajar, I saw a figure in the kitchen. They were huge, and they appeared to be wearing a thick fur jacket. I could hear them making repeated huffing sounds. They seemed to be looking through the things that were sitting on the table. He must have easily been nearly seven feet tall. But when he stood straight up, I realized my mistake in thinking it was a he at all. Because people don't have horns. At first, I thought some sort of ram had gotten inside the house and had positioned itself on the table and was eating whatever food it could find. But rams don't stand like a man and they don't have arms. I quietly made my way to the left, trying to make it to the baby's room to lock myself inside away from whatever this thing was. But as I cleared the entryway, it turned and looked at me. With another massive, angry huff, it charged out the door and disappeared into the forests outside. Quickly, I locked the front door, then I went to the baby's room and locked that door. I waited there with the baby, completely dumbfounded as to what I just experienced. I wanted to call and tell somebody so bad, but I knew I couldn't. Even you are thinking this story sounds insane. Of course I couldn't tell anyone. When the family arrived home, they paid me my promised 50 bucks and thanked me. I walked back home, always looking over my shoulder and completely traumatized. I couldn't sleep that night, and I couldn't pay attention in class the next day. Even still, if it comes up in my mind, I'm quick to remind myself it was probably just a dude with animal fur. Right, some insanely large, crazy, animal fur-wearing man broke into the house to eat the bread on the table. Yeah, that's what happened. Number seven. My Weird House in Illinois, submitted by Buttery Buns For You. In 2007, when I was 17, my parents bought a house from an older widow lady in a small town in Illinois. The house was built in the 1940s and had been built by the widow's husband. It was three stories and very nice considering its age although the paint choices for every room, including the basement, were pretty awful. My mom and her friends had to scrub down and repaint the living room walls before we moved in, as they were coated in nicotine from the widow's husband, smoking for decades, and it was pretty grimy. We lived there for about five years, and over the course of that time, a lot of strange things happened. I don't really remember the first time we started noticing weird things happening around the house, but I do know that it began by smelling cigarette smoke. We would be sitting in the living room watching TV at night, windows closed, when the smell of fresh cigarette smoke would suddenly be overwhelming. It was there one moment, and it would be gone the next. It would get so bad that we could barely breathe. Then the air would smell of nothing after that. But my dad was quick to remind us that the old man that lived there before was an avid smoker, that the cigarette smoke had gotten deep, deeper than we had cleaned, but I didn't believe that for a second, because if that was the case, it wouldn't come and go like that. Every morning before I left for school, my mom would sit on my bed and we'd talk while I got ready. One morning, we were doing just that. She was on my bed, and I was in front of my mirror brushing my hair with my back to her. I was turning to say something, and in the hallway outside the door, I saw a tall, skinny black figure with no legs below the knees. 
I remember immediately shaking, my words faltering as my mom asked me if I was all right. She said that my face had drained of all its color, and she asked me, are you okay? What are you looking at? I told her, and I started bawling my eyes out like a weirdo because it was so unexpected and frightening. I don't recall what happened right after that, but I knew that we had to brush it off and get ready for the day. Though I do know she made me tell my dad later on that night. I know he was understandably freaked out like the rest of us. My mom used to babysit a few kids in the house, and I often helped her after school and on my days off. Two of the kids I'd known their entire lives, and we had practically raised them. When I was in high school, I loved making short films, and the kids wanted to help me do one, so I cast them as the ghost kids, with my dad as the main character, whose house was haunted. We were having fun, and it was coming together pretty nicely, but I noticed that my camera and other things kept coming up missing in my room. I would lay them down on the TV stand in my bedroom, and I would find it somewhere else later after frantic searching. After this happened several times, I decided to stop making the movie. Another thing that happened that really scared the heck out of me was when my mom had started babysitting a new child. His mom was kind of a shifty person, and we couldn't really ever rely on her to arrive when she said she would. One morning in the summer, she said she would bring him around nine o'clock or so. I had the front door open so I could hear when they arrived and let them in. A little after nine, as I was walking through the living room, I heard a noise at the front door, and as I approached, I saw the kid in a bright yellow t-shirt reaching for the door handle with his face turned like he was waiting for his mother. I went over to the door, and I swear there was no one there. I thought I was losing my mind. I opened the door and looked all over, but again, there was no one in sight. Here's the weirdest part. That kid and his mom never showed up that day. She never even called my mother again and never even answered her phone after my mom tried calling her several times. It really scares me because even to this day, I wonder what happened to them. One night I was alone in my room. I felt someone tugging on the bottom of my shirt. I was once in the kitchen and heard the back screen door whip open suddenly. These things, though unnerving, were nothing compared to what was about to come. In 2009, my grandma passed away from cancer. My grandpa had the beginning stages of dementia and was neglecting himself and their pets in his grief. They'd lived in the country and had several cats and two outdoor dogs. When we had to put grandma in a nursing home, my dad saved as many of the pets as he could by adopting them out. However, my grandma's dog, Molly, came home with us. I swear that dog was one of the sweetest animals to have lived. She had been an outdoor dog her entire life, so my dad kept her under the carport behind our house and always brought her inside if it was too cold. On those cold days, I would often go down to the basement to visit Molly and hug and pet her in between doing the laundry. I loved listening to her claws click on the cement floor. She was a big fluffy dog, though we never knew what breed. If I was ever sad, she would always lick my face when I cried. She was simply an amazing animal. It was the first of February, and a huge blizzard was going to blow in. I was downstairs doing laundry. My dad went outside to bring Molly in. I was in the basement when I heard a weird noise. My dad is a goofball, and I thought he was fake crying, which he does shockingly often, but he opened the basement door and called down to me to come upstairs because Molly was about to go. He was sitting on his knees beside her on the kitchen floor as she was gasping and twitching. We gathered around her and stroked her fur, telling her what a good girl she had been and that we loved her very much. Molly passed away right there on the kitchen floor. My family took Molly's passing very hard. Not only had she been a great dog, but she had been my grandma's dog, which made it all too difficult because it was sort of like losing another part of grandma. Maybe a week or two after that, I was down in the basement doing laundry again 
when I heard something that still puzzles me to this day. Claws clicking on the cement floor. It sounded exactly like Molly. I want to say around 2010, my mother started babysitting a seven-week-old baby. He had this disease where he was allergic to a myriad of things, including his own mother's milk. But at the time, no one knew that he was sick and in constant pain, so that kid screamed constantly. It was one of the worst sounds anyone could ever hear. A horrible, non-stop screeching wail, because he hurt and didn't understand why, and of course he couldn't explain it. One afternoon, I was babysitting the baby and two older children by myself. The older ones were sitting in my dad's big recliner, vegging out watching cartoons. The baby was hungry and was doing his ear-splitting screech. I laid him in his baby donut cushion as I hurried off to prepare a bottle of his special formula. I was running back and forth between fixing the bottle and checking on the children. I'd popped a pacifier in the baby's mouth and ran to the kitchen. However, when I peeked around the corner to see that he had spit it out down by his feet, and of course at the time didn't have the motor skills to bend down and grab it for himself, the older kids were ignoring him entirely, and I was becoming frazzled. The way I had to warm up his bottle was by sticking it in a pan of water on the stove for a minute or so, so I couldn't leave it at the moment. As I was standing there, I began to smell the cigarette smoke. In the other room, I heard the baby grow silent and begin to make comforted little squeaks as he did when he was given his bottle. When the bottle was ready, I headed into the living room to find the two older boys in the same place I'd left them, still mouth breathing as they watched TV. The baby's pacifier was in his mouth. I picked him up and began feeding him his bottle. I asked the little girl watching TV who had given the baby his pacifier back. She was so engrossed, she ignored me. I said her name louder and asked again. She said she didn't know. I asked her if her brother did it. She said no, they hadn't moved. My brain short-circuited a bit after that. I was terrified and amazed at the same time. There was no way this baby could have grabbed it for himself, but it was just the four of us in the house and the two other children weren't even paying attention to anything but the show. When the baby was a little older, we all noticed that he was infatuated with a specific spot in the living room ceiling. He would stare at it for ages and laugh and smile. It was creepy. We tried to lighten the mood by saying that he had an angel in the corner. One day as I was holding him, bouncing him around and singing to him, his eyes fastened to the corner of the room again and his eyes lit up. Then, for no apparent reason, he began laughing and reached his hand up to the corner. I asked him if he could see his angel. Not even lying, the kid freaking turned in my arms. His arms were stretched out, and he followed the path of something across the ceiling. My stomach sank as I racked my brain for what the heck he could possibly be seeing. There was no light on the ceiling. Nothing. Not long before we moved out of the weird house, a family we knew had asked my mom to take care of their new baby for a few hours. We brought out the old playpen that was no longer in use, and mom parked it in the corner, and most conveniently, it was the same corner the other baby had been reaching for. Once again, I found myself in the same scenario. I was fixing a bottle for the baby as she was howling, and I noticed she had gone silent. I went in to find her gaze fixated on the same corner of the ceiling, a huge grin on her face. We moved to a normal home not long after, and everything was peaceful after that. I did start working for a nursing home, and a few years afterwards, I experienced a lot of freaky things there, but those are different stories for another time. All in all, my old home in Illinois was haunted. It was both horrifying and quite amazing at the same time. Number eight, Dark Shadow, submitted by Juan C. Back in 2015, me and my now wife stayed at her mom's house to babysit her little brother. Everything seemed fine. The day passed by and we all drifted asleep in the basement room, but something woke me up around 2.45 in the morning 
I went to get a drink of water in the kitchen. Out of curiosity, I turned around and saw a shadowy figure. It reminded me exactly now that I've seen the movie of the figure from the Lights Out movie. As soon as I saw it, I ran downstairs to my wife. I woke her up and told her what happened. She believed me, even if it was just because of how I was sweating and how pale I was. I never set foot in her mother's house again for that reason alone. Those white milky eyes from the figure will be glued into my head for eternity. Number nine, The Crib Shadow, submitted by Alina. I was babysitting my niece one night. My friend that had the baby set up a camera so I could watch it from anywhere in the house. I was studying for a test that I had the next day and I was beginning to doze off to sleep until something woke me up. It was the sound of someone whispering coming from the baby monitor. I thought it was maybe radio feedback or something. I looked at the TV and saw a very dark shadow standing over the baby's crib. There was nothing in the room that could make that shadow. It was never there before anyway. I ran to the baby's room and saw nothing, but I took the baby out of the crib just in case and took her back to the room I was in. I went back to the TV and now the shadow was completely gone. I told my brother what happened and he pulled me aside and told me not to mention this to his sister-in-law because she would flip out. He also said he has seen and heard the same things that I witnessed. They stayed in that house for about four years when my niece was just learning to talk. She would often tell her mother about her special friend. To this day, that child and everything around it scared the heck out of me. When they moved, my brother told me my niece had become inconsolably sad because she would miss her special friend. Her mom explained to her daughter, that the special friend could come with them, but all she said is that he couldn't leave the house. He was attached to it. We've never to this day told her about the dang shadow we saw, and she apparently never saw it for herself. At least, whatever it was, is stuck in that house and not stuck to the baby. And number 10 the night I helped my friend babysit a 12-year-old. Submitted by Pastel Goth Kitty. One day, my friend Allie told me she had to babysit a kid named Roger. I was a bit upset because me and my cousin Michaela were wanting to hang out with her that day. She said Roger was 12, and I told her we could help watch him if she liked. He wouldn't be all that bad anyway. He was only a little younger than us at the time. So me and Michaela went to Allie's house, and we all hung out like a normal group of friends would. But me being me, I love scary stuff, so I was saying we should do something creepy, or at least go outside to walk even though it was super dark out. We did a couple of times, but then they all got really scared, especially Roger. He said he sees someone, and I told him to stop joking around, that it wasn't funny. He turned me and pointed my head in the direction he was talking about. A few seconds later, we saw a man walking towards us. I couldn't see his face though, but the way he was walking towards us, it wasn't like another normal person walking at night. It was like he was angry and was ready to confront us or worse. We all ran back inside Allie's house and didn't go back out, though to our horror, we did see the man skulking around the front of the place for a while. He was coming for us after all, but we never figured out why. Needless to say, we never volunteered to help babysit after that. For most people, babysitting or needing a babysitter is something you really can't avoid. If you have kids, you're gonna need one. If you know someone with kids, you might be called into service pretty soon. But always be prepared and always be cautious. For those looking for a babysitter and you can't find one within the family, you never know what people are capable of. So you might be asking a random stranger to be trusted with the most important thing in your life. On the other hand, 
If you're a babysitter and some rando hires you to look after their kid at their place, you don't know what they're capable of. You don't know if they even have a kid and you don't know what might go on in that house. So before you get locked in the basement by some psychopath or get some evil spirit attached to you at some stranger's place, just remember one very important detail. I told you so. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget to send me your online gaming stories at darknessprevails.org submit. And please go download my new app, which is free at darknessprevails.org app. It's called Spooked, and it allows you to send your story anywhere on your mobile device. Read literally thousands of stories that have been submitted by people like you from all over the world, and watch any video in my catalog. Remember, it's free, and it really does help me out. Thank you. Now, as always, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video. Five creepy lift rides. Maria Vega says, Yay, thank you so much for the stories. They actually help me sleep. Quick question. What's some of the most interesting stories you've read about and posted? The one that always comes to mind, that I believe wholeheartedly, is The Lantern, The Boatman, and The Laughing Children. If you wanna read that story, get my app, use the search function, and type in lantern. It's the first result. And then you can click the story and save it to your favorites like I did. It's a great one. K. Voorhees says, I'm early and have nothing funny to say nor any jokes besides my life. <laughs> oh, dude, that's a good one. Your life, you got me crying over here. Just kidding. Your life matters, and if you think your life is a joke, at least you're making people laugh. Sweetheart Sonia says, I'll walk, thank you very much. Well, all it takes is a few degrees of a turn on the steering wheel and bam, you won't be able to walk for the rest of your life. Sounds about right, considering the drivers around these parts. Amber Flame says, let's get weird. For a second there, I thought that was a couch next to the investigator emoji. So it was getting weird before I ever realized what it actually was. Miss Clifton says, getting in the car with strangers sounds great. Oh, it definitely is. It's awesome for people who want to be tied up, duct taped, and of course, meet new people. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed. Stay safe out there and stay creepy.